Hello and welcome to Season 3, Episode 43 of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. I'm your host this evening, Andrew DeBlanc, coming to you live from a wet and wild Johannesburg. We on to tonight's main event, and uh, what a way to finish the season and this year. As you will mostly be aware, uh, we've been running our series on birding in South Africa's major cities. Uh, we visited all over, from Cape Town to Nelspruit to Polokwane to Durban to Johannesburg to Pretoria uh, to Port Elizabeth, and now we're ending off our series in Kimberley. Um, and presenting tonight is uh, someone who is no stranger to the Conservation Conversations platform. It's Dr. Doug Hairbottle from the Salt Lake University in Kimberley. Uh, he is a bird and ornithologist resident in Kimberley now. Uh, he has quite a passion for the birds of the area, particularly flamingos and water birds. Um, Doug has uh, an extensive history of, of study and research in birds all over South and Southern Africa. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, spending time with Doug very recently up in Big Falls in Zimbabwe at the Pan-African Ornithological Congress. Um, and it just reinforced uh, what an astounding researcher and birder and person that Doug is. So we're very happy to welcome him back again to Conservation Conversations. Doug presented the very popular talk on Mokala National Park last year, um, and he's also presented on Heron Remap this year. So uh, Doug is a prolific contributor to our platform. We're very appreciative. So Doug, I'm going to invite you to um, turn your video on shortly. I know that you are having load shedding issues, but you are making a plan to be with us. Um, I hope that we won't have any issues going forward. But uh, yeah, Doug, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. And we're all very much looking forward to your presentation. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Uh, and uh, yeah, so once again, thanks very much for having me on uh, Conservation Conversations. Um, it's been a real privilege to be a part of this process. and. Uh, uh, I think as last year, I'm also ending off um, this particular season. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, but thanks very much. Uh, like you said, it was good to touch base in big, in the big falls, um, and just go to sh show you how um, birding is is cross boundary, you know, and we can, you know, basically do it, you know, sort of anywhere. Um, and yeah, a big welcome to all the uh, listeners there tonight um, on the webinar. Um, and uh, hopefully going to be taking you through uh, a what I would regard as being a, a really informal presentation about birds and birding in Kimberley. Right, I'm just going to share my screen. I think while the presentation is busy loading, or just to say that I am facing uh, load shedding issues here, but uh, we should be able to get through it. Um, Okay, hold on. Okay, can everybody see my presentation? Uh, Andrew? Looking good, Doug. Take it away. Looking good, right. Thank you. Great. Okay, everybody. So, yeah, like I said, I'm going to hopefully take you on a, a sort of informal um, tour around uh, Kimberley and the surrounds and introduce you if you're not familiar with the area with regards to. Um, some of the birds and some of the birding spots. Um, it's been quite uh, challenging to select uh, areas um, because there's so many. Um, so I've kind of had to narrow it down. Um, and uh, But uh, hopefully you'll get a taste for uh, the, the kind of avifauna that we expected to see um, in the Kimberley area. All right, so just a, a little bit of history. I thought I'd just throw this in in, in the beginning. Um, so diamonds were discovered uh, in the Hopetown area in the Orange River 1867 and then um, Kimberley um, had its um, first uh, diamond discovered around 1870, 1871 and then we had Anglo-Boer Wars and so there's been a lot of disturbance taking place um, in the landscape um, in the Kimberley area for 150 years or so um, and the, the, the Vol River has, has always been you know one of the major water sources um, in the area uh, and kind of as a result of that agriculture developed and um, irrigation schemes were um, were developed as well along all the major uh, uh, river systems of all the modder the rit and the, and the orange 
Um, and so, you know, there's been these landscape changes that um, have occurred and then um, ongoing mining, uh, you know, activities um, that have taken place. I think we're all familiar with, um, you know, De Beers um, having been based in Kimberley. Um, and, and so with all these landscape changes, um, you know, there's been a lot of impact on the, on the, on the environment. But there's still large areas around of national vegetation, and uh, these are now sort of largely used for game farming. So, when we have a look at Kimberley and the Kimberley area, um, we, what we're going to see is you're going to see there's a diversity of different habitats, and we're going to have a look at at uh, this whole you know junction of um, three biomes um, quite close to Kimberley. As I've already alluded to, um, there's extensive river systems in the area, and so this uh, sort of lends itself to um, some of the riverine um, species that will uh, be found uh, along those those systems. Um, this game farm habitat, um, you know, it's it's still basically in attack, um, and uh, still large tracts of um, of this of really good habitats still around within the area. So. Um, I think the game farms have made a positive contribution in that regard. Uh, there's, there's lots of lucerne and, and maize um, and, and feedlots around. So again, providing the, the, the kind of diversity with regards to um, agricultural habitats in the area. Uh, we'll um, find that the species on the edges of the ranges. Um, and, and we're also going to have a look a bit later on into species that have recently moved into the Kimberley area. And I, I'm not going to go through them now because I've got something at, towards the end of the presentation about that. Um, but just to say up front that 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 really we're in this you know semi-arid um, zone, and so the best places for birds are um, watering points, um, and especially in the heat of the day or, or as the heat starts to build up. Um, and uh, these are going to be the kind of uh, localities where you, where you sit and wait, um, and uh, the birds basically. Come to you, you know, and uh, when they um, are coming in to drink. So, um, if you ever come up to the Kimberley area, um, uh, these are going to be the, the kind of places where you want to be um, in terms of uh, finding um, some of the specials in the area, um, or just uh, general seed eaters that are on needing to to drink. But the question I really want to ask tonight, because the the real emphasis around this is, I would like. Um, for you guys to come to Kimberley and experience uh, the the bird life in the area. So how special is the area for uh, birds and birding? And, and hopefully I'm going to be able to answer that tonight um, as we as we go along. And I kind of see this as being uh, an area that's a, a gateway to the Khalakhari and the Karoo, uh, mainly for people traveling from Gauteng and, and sort of the northeastern parts. Um, you know, which is, you know, most people make their way through to these areas. And, and, and so Kimberley becomes um, this, this stopover, this gateway um, to these areas, I believe. Right, so um, let me just get hold of the laser pointer. Um, so yeah, just very quickly um, to show you, um, I think what makes the, the Kimberley area really special is this junction of these three biomes. So we've got the the, the Grosson biome, the Nama Karoo biome, and the Safana biome. And you can see in the red circle where they, they kind of all come together and these little patches um, of um, azonal vegetation, are basically wetland areas. Um, and, and I think it's just due to this um, uh, you know, a junction of these three different biomes that um, actually makes a huge contribution to the kind of avian diversity that we have in the area. Now here we can see um, a Gabar Gosok and uh, the um, chestnut vented warbler, which are, are um, two very nice specials that one can, can find in the area. I must just say that uh, I, I haven't labeled each of um, the, 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 the images for the birds. I will go through them. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't uh, have enough time to do that. Um, but as you go through some of the slides, I will be um, um, indicating um, some of the, the the birds that can be found in the area. Um, so, and then um, obviously as we go into having a look at more detailed sites, um, I will um, um, show some of the um, of the um, species that can be found there. 
Okay, so um, then turning from biomes into, into vegetation, and I'm really not going to go through this in any greater detail, but what I really want to point out here is um, the, the kind of diversity that we have when it comes to the different types of, of, of vegetation that we find in the Kimberley area. I mean, most of it's made up of this um, Kimberley thornfelt and this northern upper Peru, little bushy type um, habitats, uh, and uh, the, the, the grassland areas, which encompass parts of the Western Free State. Um, and I think you can agree with me about just having a look at this map, how, how all these different vegetation types are going to um, play a role um, in supporting the kind of bird diversity that we find. Uh, and then just to, to mention, of course, we um, have um, summer rainfall um, in the form of thunderstorms and our winters are um, cold to mild. So, and yeah, we have a northern a black Quran, um, uh, which is one of our most uh, frequent species um, in the uh, grassland and Karoo habitats. Okay, so what I'm going to do tonight um, is um, have a look at what's um, happening sort of in the immediate surroundings of Kimberley and then a little bit further afield. So what I've done is I've uh, presented um, a 25 kilometer radius, a 50 kilometer radius and a 100 kilometer radius. Um, and we're going to be having a look at those um, in summary form. Uh, going to focus on this um, 25 kilometer radius and you'll see there's a whole bunch of sites that we're going to be having a look at. Uh, I've called that Kimberley local. Um, and then uh, we're going to venture further afield, um, going to be having a look at uh, Springbok Camp. Uh, there's some Russians down there. Um, have a look at, at McCauley again, uh, because it's one of the hotspots um, that is not too far from Kimberley. And then we're going to go up north to Spitzkorp Dam, uh, which is a real uh, gem of an area um, uh, when it comes to, to uh, being based in Kimberley and uh, and wanting to explore um, and uh, yeah, we'll be able to get into um, some of those key areas. Uh, so focusing now down um, into the 25 kilometer radius, we um, have um, the, the green is the residential areas, um, the orange indicates um, some of the mining areas, here's yes, the airport um, zone in the yellow. Um, and then we've got some of the areas that I'm going to be having a look at. So we've got Tronfield Nature Reserve, Royfontein um, over here. Um, uh, we've got the Benfontein um, to the south with um, the Benfontein Pan, um, indicated in, in blue. Uh, he has Merrick Safari, um, just to the west of Kimberley. Um, and there's uh, the Fatfontein Wetlands, um, just to the northwest of Kimberley. Uh, I'm not going to focus on the on the Platontain wetlands um, uh, because most of the other waterbird species get covered um, from the other sites. And of course, Campus Dam, which I think is the most popular wetland habitat that perhaps everybody's uh, familiar with uh, just due to the lesser flamingo populations. Uh, and of course, a whole range of other waterbirds, but uh, um, uh, very famous for the lesser flamingo uh, populations. And I've I've just basically put in here um, the names of some of the roads um, in and around Kimberley that um, offer um, very good opportunities for birding. So if you come to Kimberley and uh, this presentation is being recorded, um, you can um, in, in, perhaps have a look at some of these um, roads um, as potential um, birding areas. So. We have the Samaria Road. This is the old gravel road to Bosov. It's an extremely good road um, and uh, has produced some, some really good birding. Um, we have the Ritpan Road, um, which runs down here towards the, the Free State area, um, and the Longberg Road, which is just past the Merrick entrance um, and runs through to the N12, and the Nordgedacht Road, um, which runs up here quite close to the wall um, and and up to one of the bridges um, over the wall. Um, and you know, just to mention, there has been a record of uh, blue chick bee eater um, from this particular sanity. So 
uh, it may always be useful to travel the North Kadak Road uh, just to perhaps um, have the opportunity of uh, picking up that species. Anyway, so that's the, the kind of overall um, picture with regards to the local um, science that we're going to ha be having a look at. And hopefully we'll be able to see um, more of the, the birding potential and opportunities that um, some of these sites offer. So when you come to Kimberley, um, you will be able to uh, you know, plan your, your birding trips um, in, in such a way that you can maximize uh, your time in the area. And this is all within 25 kilometer radius. Um, so before we get into the details, just some interesting information. So we having a look at the avifauna in the area and it's representative of this dry, arid or semi-arid thorntailed savanna and uh, grassland. Um, the water birds are generally at the rivers and, and, and other wetlands um, uh, and uh, areas that get naturally fl flooded. What was interesting is when I went to have a look at these, um, fifth, the, the 25, the 50 kilometer and the 100 kilometer radio, a radii um, that I've shown you in the previous slide, and having a look at the species, the richness for each, this is what I found um, um, based on the SABEP2 data. So within a 25 kilometer radius, um, we're looking at about 300 species. Uh, within 50 kilometers, um, there's an extra 21% that gets added. So we're looking at a total of about 365. And then within a 100 kilometer radius, um, that increases by another 6% um, to a total around 387 species. So it's a very rich area, um, even considering the um, 25 kilometer radius. And when we have a look at this 100 kilometer radius around Kimberley and the 387 species, this uh, amounts to 40% of um, Southern African species, 45%, so quite close to, to almost half of um, the, the representatives um, of um, South African species and 80% of, uh, of species that are found in the Northern Cape. Um, so just by having a look at, at this breakdown, um, I think one can really see um, how rich the area is uh, with regards to the bird life. Um, what can you expect to, see, to find? In other words, if you come to this area and you, and you leave this area without seeing any of, of these species, um, then uh, you'll, it, it, it will be um, quite amazing. Uh, so going back to the SABEP2 data and having a look at the top five species in each of uh, those radii, um, and I haven't included images of all the species, I've just included um, some of them, um, and the, the, the ones in blue are the ones that are unique. Um, so uh, we're looking at um, speckled pigeon, kind of sparrow, little swift, familiar chat, and, and the anteating chat. And then it starts to change a little bit the further out you go. We're looking at, uh, at the ring-necked dove, and then the Kalahari scrub robin uh, becomes quite common, together with the black-chested prinia and the laughing dove, and then the scaly feathered weaver. Look at this um, image over here. And then as you venture out into the 100 kilometer zone, um, you um, having a look at sort of adding the yellow canary uh, with regards to being um, one of the most common species with, within that radius. So it's just a very interesting breakdown when, it, when you have a look at it um, and uh, the sort of way in which the, the species utilizes habitat. So when you look at the 20 kilometer um, zone, you can see more of this urban, peri-urban uh, type species composition and the, the further away you move from Kimberley, uh, you can see we're moving into these more dry and, and, and semi-arid um, fawn felt areas. Um, and that's representative by the species um, at the 50 and the 100 kilometer zones. All right, um, in terms of um, endemics or new endemics, what proportion of, of these species um, can be found in the area? I haven't listed all of them. Um, uh, I just thought it would be better to just highlight some of the species um, that are endemic or perhaps near endemic to the area. But I worked out that there are 61 um, out of the, the possible 165 endemics or near endemics in Southern Africa. Um, so we're looking close to 40% um, is kind of re represented in that 100 kilometer radius. And we got the birds like 
uh, Bradfield Swift, um, the Rickets Quran, the, Nam the Namaqua and the Virtual Sandgrass, um, a Pruitt Battis, a Shorto, the Rock Thrush, um, um, a Pale Wing Starling, which is uh, the image over here, which I managed to get at the McGregor Museum. They're not extremely common locally within the Kimberley, um, but they seem to be coming more uh, common in the, in the area. Um, and uh, you know, Rufus Yed Warbler, species like Greyback Sparrow Lark and the Pink Bull Blocks um, are also included in this list, um, together with a Dusky Sunbird and uh, the ever popular Sociable Weaver. Uh, um, so uh, I, I think that when you um, have a look at the endemics and near endemics, there's, there's a fairly high proportion of these that, that occur um, within the Kimberley and, and the surrounding areas. Um, in terms of threatened species, so red data species, uh, 29 out of a possible 132. So that um, represents almost approaching 20%. Um, and the list is on the screen. Um, I've highlighted a few, um, Corey Busted, uh, Birchall's Corsa, Blue Crane, uh, Vesa Flamingo, uh, Blue Coron. I think back to Pelican, you know, um, is a species that occurs in the area um, every now and again. Um, Shasta Band of Plover is um, one of the nicest plovers um, that I think is around. Um, and uh, we have some um, fairly good sites for those. Uh, we've even had uh, you know, black stalk and, and Meribus stalk in the area together with European roller. And I didn't highlight Batelier, but I put that with the estimation mark because it was a record um, that, uh, or, or should I say records, I think there were two records. I got one of them uh, of of Batalia in uh, in Macala. Um so that was um, quite out of range. But uh, yeah, it's there's a, a, a fairly good representation of um, red data species that occur in the area. Uh, in terms of uh, migrants, Paleoarctic and uh, intra African, again um, we um, are. I'm having a look at um, not all the species um, that are, are represented. I've just selected uh, the ones that I, I think are important. And when we look at the long distance migrants from uh, the Paleoarctic, uh, um, Redback Shrike, Lesser Gray Shrike, these are very common in the, in the area. So if these are species that perhaps you're needing. Um, you come during the summertime, uh, there's um, ample opportunity to uh, take these species. Um, we've got lots of barn swallows. Um, they used to roost in one of the old mine sites. We're not too sure where the roost is at the, at the moment, um, but we are I'm hoping to uh, find ways in which to, to find their roost um, with, within the area. Uh, I'll speak about the lesser castle roost shortly. Um, MF Elkin is rare and, and on the edge of its range, but they do pop up every now and again. And we've been even at Western Osprey, uh, which is also another rare species at Spitzkopf Dam. He has a picture of a lesser black-backed gull, um, which we photographed and found at the Blackfontein wetlands, um, just to the northwest of um, Kimberley. So we do have our, our fair share of rarities popping up, and uh, um, the, they are often found when we when the the Hurry Bow Club goes out to do the um, quack counts or, or perhaps doing some accessing. And then we have our um, usual suspects in terms of the intra-African migrants, um, Gershop swallow, wild-fracted swallow, African reed warbler, and um, the South African cliff swallows, which um, have numerous breeding sites under culverts and other um, bridges in the area. Okay, so I thought let's set the scene. Uh, we've, ju we've just had birding big day, two teams, um, participated from the Harry Bird Club. Um, and these are indicated uh, in the red circles and the yellow circles. Um, the, um, team one got, got 134 species in 14 hours and the uh, um, second team got 120 in eight hours. So we didn't participate for the full 24 hours, but the combined count, in other words, in the blue circle over here, okay, was sent to points either in Kimberley or just to the south of Kimberley came to 166. So, um, and there were some species that we that we missed. Uh, and I think all of us can attest to that when it comes to building Big Day. Um, but I, I think um, what this is really saying is that there were, um, if you come to Kimberley and you use a 50 kilometer radius in which to do your birding, you 
especially you know during midsummer, you're most likely to pick up at least 160 to 170 species in one day, uh, which is quite good. Uh, sorry, I don't know what's okay. There we go. So these are just some of the um, specials um, that uh, we found uh, during Burning Big Day. Um, and uh, I'll pilot things like Whiskey Turn, a Yellow Crown Bishop, a Jacobin a Cuckoo, Ashy Turt, um, I'm mean, going to highlight that one, and Orange of Franklin. Uh, and uh, what was very really strange is that we missed Pygmy Falcon. Uh, uh, the awesome science that we knew of, but uh, we weren't able to locate the birds. Oh, sorry, Temmings also. You know, that was, uh, I think, one of the real special highlights for us during this uh, last uh, Burning Big Day at the Merrick Safari. So, Again, just burning big day, highlighting um, the, the you know the significance of the data that gets collected, um, especially for a uh, presentation such as this. Um, when it comes to the bird access project, um, so I've got a, a map um, showing the the, the the coverage in the Northern Cape, and when we highlight the sort of Kimberley area over here, we can see it's quite uh, you know red and 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 pink. So there's um, a lot of cards that have been collected, and I'm going to focus on the four pentads surrounding Kimberley. So there's been about 459 full protocol cards um, that have been submitted, um, 391 ad hoc. So we're getting about 850 cards. And I've indicated um, the full protocol cards um, in brackets, the ad hoc cards, and the total species for each of the pentads surrounding um, Kimberley. Um, and when we consolidate the lists for all four pentads, we come to 287 species. And that's um, just within the, this, the so-called 20 kilometer radius. Um, so by, by attacking the pentads, um, what I'd like to do now is just very quickly run through um, some of the specials um, that we have in each of these pentads surrounding Kimberley. Um, okay, so we've got the 287 species, which represents about 33%, almost uh, just over a third, well, a third of um, the um, species that can be found um, in South Africa. Uh, so in each of these pentads, um, we have species like lesser honey guide, greater kestrel, a bird swift. In this pentad, we have the lesser kestrel roost. Um, we've had um, the rarities popping up at uh, the Putland Plain wetlands, um, call it cutting call quite recently. In the past, we've had the black turn, and then I mentioned before a lesser black back goal. Um, in the pentad next to that, uh, we have got squawker heron, shaft tail paradise wide eye, um, uh, Batfield swift, and this is a sought after bird um, and occurs quite regularly and quite commonly around the Kimberley area. A black collared above it, and I will get onto that a bit later because you might say, well, what's so special about that? Uh, Emma Falcon, again, is a rarity, um, and even the black neck grebe, um, because this pentad basically includes um, the southern half of Campus Dam. The pentad to the southwest, so this is the N12 coming in here, is, is a couple of um, small wetlands um, that we visit quite regularly. So we're getting squawker herring again, um, and a battle surf. It was a good village indigo bird, you know, which is represented over here. Um, Grey Gowo bird, uh, and, and uh, again, this is a very uh, special species in the sense that it's beginning to move into the area, uh, along with uh, species like black collared barbet. There's a honey guard again uh, coming up uh, to the pentad to the southeast. Uh, again, Bradfield Swift. We get uh, dusky sunbird and the pearl spotted owlet, um, which is which is resident at one of the high schools. Um, the lesser honey guide um, in this particular pentad um, over here. Um, is resident at, at one of the houses um, because they um, have um, uh, a, a, he's a beekeeper you know, and they've got uh, a couple of hives. Um, so this honey guard is basically guaranteed. Okay, so just a, a quick overview showing you sort of you know um, the, the, the kind of species coverage and, and some of the more interesting species that we can find just in these pentads that surround um, the Kimberley CBD and, and some of the urban areas. Um, what's nice for us is we have a lesser kestrel roost um, that's indicated here um, by the red dot. It's um, in the township area of Galashewe um, and the big blue gum. Uh, there were um, two other trees that were used, um, but it looks like the birds have, have moved um, to this big blue gum 
um, in this particular um, location of um, Galashiri. Uh, and um, hopefully you know, the video is not going to play. Okay, this is supposed to be a video um, over here, but it's fine. You can see the, um, in these, these birds coming into roost every evening. Um, and uh, this forms part of the Kestrel Survey Project and, and, and the Bird Club gets involved with this. Um, we've also managed to get the media involved to come out, local newspapers engage with the community who um, who live in the area. They sit, they sit under the tree, um, and we and we're really trying to involve them and uh, make them more aware of the significance of these birds, um, these long distance paleontic migrants that that only um, come to Kimberley during the summer months. And a lot of the times, the community is aware of this, um, and their um, knowledge of 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 the birds in the past um, has has been quite intriguing, and uh, so hopefully the, uh, the bird club, together with other uh, stakeholders, can get more involved um, in uh, protecting this tree um, for the lesser kestrels. I'm sorry, there's a video playing now. So we're getting um, a couple of thousand birds you know, that are coming into roost every evening. Okay, so let's move on to some of the sites in Campus Dam. Um, famous site, everybody knows about Campus Dam, you know, um, five kilometers uh, north of, of Kimberley. And in the past, it was a seasonal pan. Now it's a permanent system with, with inflow from wastewater and stormwater, which gets exacerbated by high rainfall events. And when this happens um, and water levels are not maintained, it's not good habitat for the flamingos. And often, um, flooding occurs adjacent to the railway line and in 12, and this is producing actually quite good water bird habitat at the moment. Uh, um, and it's it's mainly a water bird hotspot, but uh, there's some, um, some surroundings, um, Thorntail Savannah, and um, also is able to um, support a whole host of, of species from that habitat. It's an important you know, bird area and um, a key biodiversity area um, of the region, um, mainly based on the um, it is the flamingo populations. Um, so it's a haven for these birds. Unfortunately, with the high water levels in the last two years, um, the flamingos um, have have left, uh, haven't returned yet. So um, it's, it has to do with the management of um, of the water levels uh, in the dam. And hopefully, we can do that so that the the flamingos can return. Um, the 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 S Island that was um, developed by um, Mark Anderson and Equip Mining. A way back to encourage the birds not get used or when it is exposed um, the gray-headed gulls make use of that to to breed and other interesting species are like whiskered tern the chestnut banded plover and rufus head warbler um, in the surrounding thornfelt there's a big uh, cattle egret heavenry um, in the south so these are the kind of uh, images that we would uh, like to see again um, and this is i think really the gem of kimberley you know, um, and uh, I know that there are um, initiatives underway um, in order to um, try to, you know, manage the water levels correctly and provide um, the correct habitat for the flamingos. Um, uh, it really is a spectacle when you've got 70, 80,000 flamingos um, at Campus Dam. Um, and hopefully um, we can experience images like this uh, not too long in the future. Uh, yes, I'm just some other species that we have um, photographed or I photographed um, at Campus Dam. Uh, there's Amber Falcon, Hummer Corp. Um, this is a part of the dam in the south um, uh, when water levels recede and it opens it up for lots of shoreline and, uh, and we get lots of waders coming through. The black neck greaves are always nice to see at the dam. This was quite recently in that flooded area between Campus Dam and the end. Well, there were a couple of uh, squawker herons. So again, I, the, the, um, I'm not going to be showing too many images after each of the sites, but just to give you an overall picture as to what um, one can expect in terms of the habitat and um, some of the species, just to get you excited about coming to Kimberley. Um, Merrick Safari. Um, so this is uh, about 10 kilometers on the uh, Douglas Road um, to the, the west of Kimberley, very popular birding spot, um, and uh, especially so for a nocturnal mammal, um, uh, hearing. 
So there's a lot of tour operators that um, that go to Merit Safari um, just to have a look at these nocturnal maps. But there's a lot of good birding that takes place at the same time. So it's mainly Kimberley Thornfelt and there's a large marshy pan, um, which when it fills um, is a haven for water birds. Uh, there's a lot of um, artificial watering sites, windmills uh, uh, that are pumping water um, into, into troughs and these are really good for seed eaters. So we get species like blue crane, there's a, a breeding pair on the property, which is um, always nice to see. And we got uh, some nice images last week from Birding Big Day. Uh, we've got the macro sand grass, uh, which is a nice species to have, a pink bald lark, um, almost guaranteed at Merrick. Um, we've had a, a, a vagrant, uh, well, I think two records now of, of, of Maribu's talk um, um, at the farm. And uh, so these are just immature birds that have left the breeding sites and they're just wandering um, and uh, for some reason they have um, ended up um, just outside Kimberley. Um, we've got the breeding secondary birds, um, common quail, um, lots of sociable weaver colonies with pygmy falcons. And then just recently there was a, a, a record of a lilac breasted roller, um, which for this part of the world is really, really exciting. So just some images um, from Merrick. Um, we've got Kittles' plover, he has the blue cranes from last week's Birding Big Day, and you can just see the two little heads popping up here. These are the, are the two chicks. Um, we've got spotted eagle owl um, against the copies, uh, um, not too far from the, from the homestead. Uh, he has some pictures of the pan when it gets flooded um, and it becomes a red billed teal haven. Uh, it also supports other species like black wing stilt, um, eversets. Um, you know, Cape Shrub, there's a whole host of other duck species, and then, of course, flamingos. And um, not too long ago, when the pan filled, we had a large a number of um, greater flamingos uh, that arrived at the pan, together with um, uh, a much smaller number of lesser flamingos. Um, and unfortunately, the, the, the pan has now dried up, so these birds have moved on. Um, one species that is quite nice to, to have in the area is the green winged petilia. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you notice here, but this has got a yellow face. Um, and uh, this was um, quite a nice find. This is the yellow morph of the, the green ring petilia, which was photographed um, at Mary. You, know, you can see these, um, these water troughs and uh, these seed eaters just flock to them um, during the sort of mid morning and the heat of the day. Um, and, it's, and, and it's best to go to Merrick um, to try and find time, just to sit at these troughs and let the birds come to you. Um, right, then we go to Royfontein, and this is a local game farm, not very far outside Kimberley, about three kilometers on the Bossel Road. It's, it's owned by Carpen Mining. It's a membership-based um, farm, so it's called the Royfontein Wildlife Club, and uh, you pay a nominal fee per year, which allows you entry into the farm. Um, and uh, there's, there is a camping, and there is some um, accommodation um, in the on the farm and, and it's open to, to visitors. Um, so if, you put, if you're coming through, this might be one of the places that uh, you would like to stay. Uh, it's predominantly Kimberley Thornfelt and in some wetland areas in the Southwest, plus a lot of artificial drinking sites as is pictured here. A real bonus about Royfontein is that you can get in um, at, at seven o'clock. It's the last time that you are, are allowed in. Um, and then you've got to stick to the main roads um, uh, but it allows you then to drive around with a spotlight and having a look at some nocturnal birds, um, owls and courses, um, and night jars, for example. Um, so that's um, quite a nice um, aspect to um, being a member um, of, um, of Rufentain Wild Earth Club. Uh, and uh, some of the species that uh, might be of interest. Um, there's there's Corey and and Ludwig's you know busted on the farm. Corey, uh, in my books, is a, a bit more common than Ludwig's. Um, I haven't seen Ludwig's um, all that often, but other members of the of, of the bird club have. Um, actually, turkey is a species that a lot of people um, are, um, do need on their lists, um, and it's very common at Wavington. Um We had little bee eater recently, which is another rarity um, for the area. Uh, we've even got the yellow morph of the crimson-breasted shrike. 
this is you know this has been a recent find on the farm so that's a, a really special um tick for uh the the you know, the area uh we've got fawn colored lark which is very common and then like i mentioned we can you know if you're driving around at night um the roof is cheeked and night jaws uh, especially during summer um are a very common on the road um as you are driving out there's also a big heronry um that that forms um when the natural wetlands are flooded and that's happening at the moment um you know this is a place called the koi pond um so one of the accommodation the rustic accommodation is not too far from here and at the pond you get these black faced wax balls that um, come down to drink um the Marika flycatcher um, is also a very um, common species in the cold savannah areas so this is just a quick overview um, of uh, um, of the site. Um, the other species that you like to see is Eastern Clapper Lark, he has the fawn colored lark, uh, the rufous cheeked nightjar uh, that I mentioned, um, that just sits in the road, look out for them, you're driving with your headlights, um, you will be able to um, pick them up um, quite easily. Double banded courses are also um, quite easily seen and quite common on the farm. Ludwig's busted and swallow tailed bee eaters are, um, is, is also another species that that frequents the farm. So this is just to give you a little taste of, um, of what one can expect um, on Royfontein. Um, okay, then uh, we're going to move to Benfontein game farm and uh, uh, 74 species, so uh, a, a fair species list. This is the Beers game farm, five kilometers outside Kimberley on the Bloemfontein road. And there's a mixture of habitats. So we've got this big uh, um, salt pan, uh, which is usually dry. It, it, it really only fills when there's there's heavy rain, uh, which has happened in the last year. Um, so and this is a picture um, of um, a part of, of the pan, and you can um, see some greater flamingos um, that uh, have taken up residence. Otherwise, there's lots of thorn tail savannah and then a grassland as well. Uh, and it's the home of the of the UCT Sociable Weaver Project. So opportunities to go and see um, some research in action um, on this particular property. Um, so um, highlights here of secretary bird, there's a tawny eagle, um, which is a very nice um, um, species records for the area. We've got a blue crane again. Uh, we've got a pink pulled lark, and he has a picture of, uh, of the pink pulled lark. Um, they're relatively common in the area. The white black cape and leopard face vultures. And then just recently, um, we've, we, we had a sickle ring to chat, um, which is um, really uncommon in the area. Um, uh, but we managed to, to find an, an individual during one of our um, visits. Uh, I think it was during our scheduled quack count. Um, but it was very difficult to get to the pan to do the count. Um, but we managed to do some atlasing at the same time. So yes, the sickle winged chat that uh, that we that we picked up, um, um, sociable weaver. Uh, again, this is a, a very iconic species um, for the the um, semi-arid and and arid savanna areas. Um, but uh, it's, it's such a nice species. Um, I think can always get some very good photographic um, opportunities. Uh, we have a greyback French lock, uh, which we also picked up during the same um, uh, outing that we got the um, chat in. Uh, the secretary bird uh, is commonly um, seen on the farm together with the vultures and uh, the, the black winged kite. Uh, so, they, so again, just a nice uh, overview and feel for what happens um, on a on point day. Drone field. So this is another De Beers um, um, farm just to the north of Kimberley, um, to the east of the Campus Dam. So just outside Kimberley. Uh, so this is the kind of habitat that you can expect, mainly Kimberley Thornfelt. Um, and um, it's, it's the home of um, a breeding white bank of vultures, where there's been a long term monitoring and ringing program that has taken place over the last 30 years. Um, there's a vulture restaurant um, in the reserves, opportunity to um, sit in a hide and um, experience vultures are coming down to um, to feed and there is accommodation on the reserve as well. Um, so all three vulture species um, do occur in the reserve. Um, some overlap share with secretary bird. We I had African cuckoo not too long ago. Um, we had both fire finch, uh, rufus had warbler is another species that um, is quite sought after by a lot of birders. Uh, and here's a picture 
sorry, of the lilac crested roller um, that um, has recently been seen in the area. Um, you know, these birds are um, uncommon, uh, not seen every uh, every year, um, and uh, so these are nice records to to have um, for these localities. And then, um, just uh, interestingly, um, during the last uh, Volta ringing exercise, there were some unconfirmed reports of pennant winged nightjar um, on the farm, um, and uh, we just haven't had the opportunity to to go out and, and confirm this. Um, but uh, if if we can confirm it, it would really be, I think, one of the, the most interesting records um, um, for the area. So some uh, species that are you're most likely to find there that may be of interest, long-tailed paradise wide-eye, uh, short white-backed vultures sitting in the tree at the vulture restaurant, uh, red wolf firefinch, uh, the ever beautiful crimson-breasted strike. Uh, he has a rufous-eared warbler. Um, who's giving you the stare. And this was um, one of the African cuckoos that um, has recently been seen on the farm. So again, just a small selection um, of, uh, of the species that you're likely to pick up um, at uh, Cronfield. Uh, then I'd like to go to just further south, about 40 or so kilometers south of Kimberley near, near Modder River. It's a place we call Springbok Camp Wetlands, and, it, and it's been um, a, a Quack site um, um, ever since the um, days when Mark Anderson and Eric Herman were around. Um, but to me, this is one of the, the, the water bird gems um, around Kimberley. Um, and it's um, uh, a part of the, the area is the agricultural research arm um, um, that, that has, been, has been established um, in, in the Modern River area. It's a, big, it's a big agricultural area. Um, so there's a lot of irrigation dams and this big natural marsh. And then um, at one of the farms at the back, there's this big uh, a salt pan. And, and this is a real um, a gem of the site, you know, this um, salt pan. Um, so one needs to get permission from the farmers um, in order to drive around. Um, but if you come to Kimberley and you're keen to go, you just make contact with Moss itself um, and uh, we can or uh, make appropriate arrangements. So we're getting white-backed ducks and fulvous ducks. We get blue cranes in the area. We've had a great crown crane um, pop up at the marsh here. Uh, we've had marsh owl, and this was during one of our birding big days in, I think, 2019, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, recently, we've had an oddball duck uh, that um, has been seen. So um, it's a real special species for the area. The salt pan at the back here is home to chestnut banded plovers, um, black neck grebes, um, and whiskered and uh, white terns. Um, so it, it really is a, a special water bird locality um, as, as, as far as I'm concerned. And you can see we, we're getting up to almost 200 species. Um, and this is based on the Atlas data, but it's primarily um, a water bird hotspot. So there's a white back duck. Um, he has a, a purple heron wandering around in the marsh, um, white wing ferns um, that uh, are, are summer visitors. Uh, unfortunately, this is the best pictures we have of the knobbull duck. Um, you can see three or four um, individuals here um, in the marsh area. The um, ever beautiful breeding of that grebe. Um, and yes, the picture of the great ground crane uh, that we picked up on one of the breeding big days um, together with a single lesser flamingo. Um, but under really good conditions, you get large duck populations. So the, the fulvous duck, the white-faced duck, and the yellow duck um, can occur in um, large, large numbers um, in this marshy area um, that uh, that sits around the farms. Okay, Macaula. Um, so, and I've included Macaula, even though I did give a presentation on it, and I've included the link down here. Um, uh, because it's only the the you know Lilydale camp is only fifty kilometers from Kimberley, so it falls within that fifty kilometer radius. Um, and it's a and it's an absolute privilege to be only fifty kilometers from um, I think one of the the most fabulous national parks that there that there is. Um, and it's because there's a good diversity of habitats. You know, there's this wonderful grassland area in the north and the Dolorite copies. 
um, water was south, and there's Swanfelt, Savannah, and some Karoo patches, water holes, and, and dams, which really makes for um, a really good bird list. Um, as I mentioned in my previous presentation, the Stoftum bird hide is really the hotspot. Um, and, and you could sit in the hide and um, easily get a list of about 25 species. You know? um, and uh, the, the kind of species that I think sort of make um, one sort of, you know, wanting to get to Makala, I mean, it was very difficult to choose, but, um, you know, black chest, the snake eagle, and virtual sand grass are, um, you know, they, um, both species breed um, at, at Makala. Uh, like I said, we mentioned the, about the Batelier record, uh, the, the vultures and the sociable weaver and the big meat falcons together, red billed oxpeckers, um, which have been introduced to the, the park knots, uh, you know, um, back in 2007. We get playing back puppets and um, we also get African cuckoo. So just a small selection of birds from uh, the park. Um, Cory Buster is always nice. Curry scrub robin, this was taken at Lilydale, um, and this is a bird on the edge. This is not normally a sort of a Karoo based species, um, so very nice to get it there. Virtual sand grass, striped kingfisher, um, I find um, to be one of the most nicest kingfishers around, um, and uh, I, I regularly pick it up at Makala. The mountain wheat here, um, this is at Mosu Camp, and the red crested Koran. Um, yeah, these birds are very, very common um, in Makala. Driving along the road, you often see them, and then you, you, you stop the vehicle and they begin to call. Oh, so, um, yeah, just a, a, a really small selection that was very difficult to um, to choose. Um, but because it's within within reach of Kimberley, you come to Kimberley as your as your as your base. You can then um, explore these areas that I've I mentioned before, but you can venture further out and you can get to Makala. Uh, within half an hour. And then sort of lastly, um, to choose a site that's a bit further away, um, it has to be Spitzkorp Dam. You know? So 208 species, um, um, and it's about 70 kilometers uh, northwest of um, of the town. Uh, and and uh, it's, it really is a, a water bird hotspot. Uh, um, but the surrounding vegetation of the Stormfelt, um, also is able to deliver a whole host of interesting species as you're busy driving around the dam. So um, there's all sorts of different habitats that are available, like I mentioned, and there's often open shoreline and, and the mudflats when the water levels are low. At the moment, the water levels are very, very high. Um, and uh, that is, has not created a lot of good um, um, habitat for um, the kind of diversity of water birds that we expect to find. But when there is shoreline available, then it's good migrant shorebird or um, wader habitat, and they can occur there in really good numbers. So one of the quack sites that we do. Um, and so the kind of species that we kind of, I mean, again, it was very difficult, but these are just some of the very nice ones we've picked up. Um, we've had both great white pelican and pink back pelican, a goliath heron, a very large population, the edible stalk, uh, great egret, uh, Black heron, which is um, very nice um, for the province. Whoops, I've got Goliath heron twice, but there must have been two individuals then. <laughs> uh, Caspian terns, um, again, um, a, you know, part of the, the, the inland population um, of the species. You've had black stalk, um, not at the dam per se, but there's small little pans as you drive into the dam, and we've uh, managed to pick up um, at least one individual uh, in the past. A shaft-tailed wider is um, always nice to, to pick up in the surrounding Thornfelt. White-winged widow has been a really special tick in the past. Um, and I'll show you a pick of this now. Uh, and the rarities have come in the form of a yellow wagtail and black-winged uh, pratting call. In fact, the yellow wagtail is kind of a fairly regular migrant um, and rarity at, at Spitzkorp. Uh, um, together with black green the pratting call um, as well, but in small numbers. Um, so again, this is just a water bird gem, you know, not, not too far from uh, Kimberley, and you've got the opportunity to drive around the dam um, and, um, you know, experience the, the immense water bird diversity that this site offers. So here's the yellow wagtail, um, really, um, photographed by Brian Culver, one of the Kharik Bird Club members. Um, 
vegetable stalk, the black heron um, doing its um, famous um, um, pillar maneuver. He has the back wing critical that we um, picked up during one of our crack counts, um, Caspian turns and sharp tailed wider. And I have to throw in another one of these slides because it was just such a good spot. Um, the white winged widow, which is um, kind of on the edge of its range and perhaps extending its range um, a bit westwards, um, because this was a species that I did not um, expect to find. Uh, so we've got great white pelican and pink backed pelican um, that have been seen. The pink backs are more common. Um, and uh, so we were um, surprised really to um, see these great white pelicans you know, at, at the dam during one of our counts. Um, one species I haven't mentioned, but occurs there is red cap lock um, and always guaranteed uh, Goliath heron. Uh, there's it's such a beautiful heron and uh, there's lots of these species that, I mean, individuals that can be found as you drive along the shoreline and ground scraper thrush, uh, which is another species that can be found in Kimberley, but it was also a species that we picked up um, as you drive into Spitzkorp Dam in the Thornfelt, um, you know, surrounding the dam. So it's um, a quite a nice species for the area. Right, so I'm gonna kind of end off now um, and, and, and just briefly mention things that for, for us birders in Kimberley is quite exciting stuff. You know, it might not be exciting for, um, for, for other birders from other areas, but this is, I think, really important because it shows the value of what bird monitoring can do through SABAT2. Um, and so a big shout out to all our atlases out there who, who continuously collect information, collect the bird data that we need so we can look at things like this. So that, and, and really what I want to focus on are the, are the blue squares and the, the darker the blue, the, the greater the change in the reporting rates between the first bird atlas and the second bird atlas. And so what we're kind of seeing here is um, these range shifts that are starting to be picked up through the bird axis project. He has a blue wax ball, um, very common thornfeld species. Um, but you can see how more and more um, blue squares are beginning to appear in, in the southwest. Um, and this is a bird that is beginning to move um, into Kimberley um, over the last while and is now um, frequent at the, the off time bird hive at Macaulay. So very interesting. We have the gray go away bird as well. We've um, more and more records of the species are popping up. Um, as you can see, there's um, these three pentads here, sort of with you know around Kimberley and just to the west, uh, and other areas in the in the in the northern Cape. Um, so this is another bird that seems to be moving in a southwesterly direction. Um, even a species for us, like the black collared barbet, um, again, you can see this um, southwesterly shift occurring, um, more and more records um, around the around the Kimberley area and, and even in the free states around the Bloemfontein area. The green wood hooper is, is also another species um, that, that seems to be moving in this direction. It, it was a species that wasn't commonly seen, uh, you know, five, 10 years ago, perhaps. and. Um, now we've got um, basically resident populations in certain areas in and around Kimberley. Um, a lilac crested roller is another one. Um, I mean, it's, you know, besides there being um, uh, shifts in the other direction for these areas, again, we can see these blue um, pentads lighting up here, um, sort of indicating that uh, these birds are um, being found um, more and more regularly. Uh, within uh, the the Kimberley area, and southern yellow-billed hornbill as well um, is, uh, although it's um, frequently seen, it's uh, a species that um, is also showing um, a range shift um, in this um, southwesterly direction um, and beginning to become more frequent within areas of the Northern Cape. So, in summary, then. Um, yeah, Kimberley is just a great birding spot. And uh, when we look at it from the aspect of that it's supporting nearly 40% of South Africa's bird species, I, I think that, um, you know, sort of really hits home. You know, that uh, once you start looking at the data and, um, and all these records that are coming in, you know, we can really say, well, this, you know, this area does support um, a, 
a, a large diversity of, um, of species. And I think it's because of this myriad of habitats. Um, as I mentioned before, the, this, this conjunction of the three biomes and the other vegetation types, and, um, and, it's, and most of it occurs within a small radius, even within the 20 kilometers. So um, this really does provide opportunities for a whole host um, of, 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 of different species to occupy different habitats. Um, Hotspots, well, Campus Dam, Americ Safari, Grandfield, Spitzkop Dam, um, if I had to choose. <laughs> um, otherwise, um, everything that I've mentioned tonight would be, would, would be a hotspot. Um, uh, it's just some really exciting localities in and around Kimberley, um, if you want to tick off some of those species. As I mentioned now, there's some interesting rain shifts and uh, hopefully we can continue to monitor those. So um, if you're an atlaser, you come to Kimberley, please try and, and, uh, and do atlasing, especially in those um, underrepresented pentads. Um, for us Kimberlites, this is really special. Um, and, uh, but perhaps there are other areas that are also picking up these, these um, um, shifts in, in some of the, the species ranges. So there's a good percentage of, of arid and semi-arid species. And uh, um, even though um, perhaps you can, find these um, on your, or in the Kalahari, or, or perhaps in the Karoo, uh, I think it's um, really important that this, that Kimberley is this gateway um, to these areas. And, and you can then uh, find the time to focus on perhaps the other specials that occur in the Kalahari and the Karoo, um, because you can find the most of them um, with, with this, you know, within a very short distance around um, the Kimberley precinct. Uh, so I'd like to thank um, um, Eric and, and Mark and Tanya and, and, and Brian and Bender and Trevor um, uh, for photographs and, inf and information pertaining to uh, the sites. Again, thank you to the many bird actors out there who have helped actually put this information together. And of course, the Kharib Group, the Kharib Bird Club, um, and, and the many, the, the, the team that focuses on doing the, the Counts because we've been able to garner a, a whole host of interesting records just by by these organized events going out and and finding um, you know the the special fragrance um, or perhaps large populations that we never found before. So it, it becomes such an important component of a club to get involved with these activities um, because it makes a huge contribution. Uh, and so, as much as we have this this really great bird diversity um, uh, with, with, you know, within the Kimberley precinct, we also have um, these amazing um, Northern Cape sunsets. Nobody can beat a Northern Cape sunset. So um, thank you for your attention and hopefully we see you in Kimberley soon. Thank you so much, Doug. What a brilliant way to finish off this year's, uh, see oh, this year's uh season of conservation conversations. Um, there's a reason we keep getting you back for the last talk of the year. It's because it's always a highlight. We always enjoy <laughs> having you on. You, you really do put a hell of a lot of effort and thought into your presentations. Now, I saw a comment just now saying, someone said, um, I'm completely Kimberley'd after this talk. So I think you've achieved your goal of, of uh, exciting people about this area. Um, you're gonna have a lot more visitors and, and people, people wanting to come and uh, burn in your neck of the woods or your, your neck of the your neck of the semi-desert um <laughs> yeah. yeah excuse the pun um yeah there's a lot of people saying thanks in the chat room uh, just to remind everyone that this is the last uh webinar for the year on conservation conversations we have our first webinar next year on the 24th of january on the bird of the year the cape gannet our cape gannet that's this year's this year's bird the cape parrot um and i'm sure that's going to be a very popular one um, great. So we have some questions. We have one question here on uh, on Zoom. Uh, a reminder to everyone: if you do have a question for Doug, just pop it into the Q and A box. I'll also check the Facebook uh, comments section. Um, Penny Abbott from Inquiries asked: uh, How easy is it to drive around Spitzkop Dam and to access the further areas? Okay. So, so access to to Spitzkop Dam. Um, uh, we haven't had any trouble you know, getting into the dam. Um, uh, unfortunately, there is kind of no 
map that you got access to. Oh, so, but um, it's it's not too difficult um, as you as you drive through the main entrance. Then there's a whole host of network of of uh, roads running around the dam. Um, sort of little inlets that go down to the shoreline. Uh, when the issue line of available, uh, I think at the moment some of those roads are probably completely flooded. Uh, so uh, it may not be possible to get down to the shoreline of of the dam per se. Um, but you know, sort of when the optimal conditions at at the dam, uh, you basically just drive along and follow the gravel roads, um, and then um, up to up, up to a certain point um, you can see a toll road on the left hand side which you can take back which takes you over the bridge and from the bridge you can view the damn wall uh, I think the best is perhaps um, uh, to go into Google Maps uh, and uh, or, or, or Google Earth uh, perhaps zoom in um, and uh, have a look at the road networks um, but yeah you know, normally there's no problem um, getting into the dam itself um, we've never sort of been asked to, uh, but no, there's no entrance fee. It's mainly a fishing spot. <laughs> so um, they usually just allow, you know, people like ourselves in so that we can drive around and, uh, and do our birding. I picked up another message in the chat box. Um, so reminds everyone, please do pop your questions in the Q&A so I can actually find them. Uh, but there was one from Les than this saying, uh, a similar, similar question about camp with Dan. Um, how does one access that, and what are the roads like? Okay, yeah. So, a campus dam um, is predominantly privately owned. Yeah. Um, so, access to to campus is something that needs to be arranged, um, and that is something that can be done through myself and the bird club. Um, uh, there's there's no public access um, onto campus dam. Um, so one would would need to make contact so that we could make the arrangements. Um, often the roads are are really bad, um, and and uh, it just depends on the time of year. It depends on the condition of the dam, the water levels, um, how much flooding takes place. Um, but you know, you know, we've got a relationship with the landowner, and uh, so um, you know we can definitely help and assist for those people that uh, would like to get to campus dam. And now, I suppose, especially when they are flamingos, you know, at the moment, <laughs> there's unfortunately um, hardly any you know, flamingos on the dam. You know. um, so it's a case of the, perhaps the, through the Khiri Bird Club and our Facebook page and um, posting on the Bird Life Africa page that when things do change, um, then uh, the, you know, we can let people know. Um, and you're welcome to contact us. You know. um, if you just Google Hari Bird Club, um, there's um, a link to, to a website and an email address. You know. but there, there, there is some public access via the casino side, but it's, um, uh, it's it, you know, the road is, is, is not good sometimes, and you, you can't get to the spots that, that you really need to get to if you want to um, see the flamingos, uh, for example. Hmm. Brilliant, Doug. Thanks so much. Um, I'm very keen to come down and see that uh, that part of your, your part of the world. I spent a lot of time in Mokana National Park. Um, last time was January this year. It was quite hot, but uh, very enjoyable. Love going yeah. back there. Um, Absolutely. And, and there's a lot of a lot of really good exploring to do in that border area, as we've shown. And there's a lot more to Kimberley yeah. than just a big hole. And um, from, a birding, <laughs> from a birding perspective, there's a hell of a lot to see. You know, I remember even... Um, Getting a new species for the Macala list in that I think it was a, a Montes Harrier um, in January. So it's a it's an underexplored and underappreciated part of the world that we really appreciate you enlightening us um, about uh, what what's in store for visitors. And I'm sure people will use this as a resource going back for a long time. So that's it um, from us tonight. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Doug, for your your time and, and your efforts. No, thank you once again. And uh, yeah, people are welcome to contact me. Um, as I said, just Google Curry Bird Club um, and there'll be an email address and uh, and we'll be able to make contact. Yeah. But thanks for, very much for having me again. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thanks everyone from the Conservation Conversations team for tuning in this year. This is our last episode and uh, we will see you fresh and early next year. But in the meantime, 
Um, stay safe out there if you're going on the roads during the holidays. Um, enjoy yourself. Have a, a great rest. Have some relaxation. Enjoy some birding wherever you find yourself under a festive season. And yes, we'll see you in 2023. All the best, everyone. Good night.